Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. This is part of Big Questions, Big Ideas, our partnership with Ball State University's Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies. I am Joe, a reference librarian here at Kennedy Library. Today, we'll be discussing time shifts, future orientation in pandemic everyday life. And we're joined by the project directors of the Everyday Life in Middletown project, Pat Collier and Jim Connolly. And they're going to just be examining a lot of the different ways that the pandemic has disrupted daily life as part of their collection of diaries and other materials to describe daily life in Muncie since 2016. Thank you so much for joining us, Jim and Pat. Wonderful to have you. Good to be hey, here. Uh, I'm Pat Collier from the English Department and the College of Sciences and Humanities at Ball State. You want to say hi, Jim? Sure. I'm uh, Jim Connolly, director of the Center for Middletown Studies. Uh, I work with Pat on the Everyday Life in Middletown project. So uh, I'm going to start us off and um, uh, start by giving you an overview of the entire project. Um, and then I will hand it off to Jim in a few minutes, and he's going to talk about some details. But um, just to start off, I mean, we're our topic for today is the is something that should be familiar to everyone, I'm pretty sure, and that is the way in which the pandemic has messed up our sense of time. Uh, I think pretty much everyone's been talking about this at one point or another. The way that uh, days feel like weeks, or sometimes weeks feel like weeks feel like days, um, and so that's our topic for today. But before we dig into the topic, I'm going to um, introduce you to the project overall. Some of you may have seen us at the library before the pandemic. This is our second BQBI, um, but I'll I'll give a back some background on the project um, for those of you who don't know anything about it. Um, I want to start with the idea of the everyday. Uh, what you see here on your screen is our website, um, which is our archive, which I'll talk about in a second. But let's start with the idea of the everyday. Um, the everyday is exactly what it sounds like. It's the, it's the routine. It's, or, it's the ordinary. It's things that you do that generally don't get recorded, right? So walking, uh, walking to the car in the morning, brushing your teeth, um, changing your clothes, uh, the stuff that goes through your mind uh, while you're walking around your office or whatever it is you do. Um, the everyday, one way to think about the everyday is that it is the thing that generally doesn't get recorded. Um, uh, history books, memoirs, um, even the news, when it records the very recent past, um, doesn't typically record routine things and ordinary things. It typically records events and the exceptional, right? Um, and so one of the reasons for studying the everyday is the fact that it generally doesn't get recorded. It sort of evaporates even as it's happening, right? So um, we have been working on studying the everyday in Muncie, Indiana since 2016. You probably know that Muncie is the middle town of the famous sociological study. Um, and so um, our project here is to create an archive of everyday life in Muncie. Uh, the way we do that is we have a, a panel of volunteer writers who uh, uh, three to four times a year uh, write a day diary where they record everything that they do in a single day. We actually just did this this past Monday. So we wrote to all of our volunteer writers and we said, Monday is going to be diary day. And so they, um, they kept a diary of everything they did during that day. Our prompt for our writers is uh, write down what you do and what you're feeling and thinking. And so four, three or four times a year, we get this record of what's happening in, in our writers' ordinary lives uh, as they go through their day. Um, and what we're doing with this is we've created an archive, right? And so this is an open access, kind of like instant archive. It takes a couple of weeks to get diaries up, but we get them up there pretty quickly. And so if you go to this website, you can read um, all of the diaries we've gathered over uh, almost six years of doing this. Um, to speak a little bit about the objectives of this project, why we're doing this, um, just to tell you a little bit of the history first, this started as a class of the Virginia Ball Center in 2016, um, where I led a class of 15 students uh, where we, you know, we, we launched this diary project. Um, we also created a, an, an older website and we uh, made a documentary movie um, about everyday life here in Muncie. Um, but to get into a, some of our, you know, uh, maybe deeper objectives here, 
One of the things we wanted to do is focus on a single community. Um, there have been projects like this before. In fact, one of our major inspirations is a project in England that has been doing this like nationwide in the UK um, uh, since the 80s. And even actually, it was actually founded in the 30s. There was a gap in the mid-century where they weren't doing it. Um, but that's, you know, that's a national scale project. We really wanted to focus on, on the local community, partly because of Muncie's history as Middletown. Um, but also because um, there's a way in which culture is getting nationalized, politics are getting nationalized, uh, people are spending their online time, and of course people, people are spending a lot of time online, people are spending their online time in communities that are not geographic, um, and in fact in the online space people are spending a lot of time in uh, communities that are actually mutually hostile with each other. And so part of the um, objective here is actually to actually use the everyday as, um, as a space to bring people together locally um, around, the, around the question of what everyday life is like here in Muncie. And so our website, you know, obviously um, hosts all of these diaries that our volunteer writers write, but we also have a blog and we're sort of seeking to create discussion around everyday life here uh, locally. Um, and so that's the, you know, sort of like almost sort of utopian um, idea of the project, the idea that we would, you know, sort of get people to come together over everyday life, seeing that everyday life is in fact close to universal. Um, our everyday lives might be quite different from each other, but we all have one, right? Everybody wakes up in the morning, everybody lies down uh, at some point and sleeps. Uh, if there is something that unifies us all, it probably can be found in the everyday. Um, so that, like I said, that's sort of the utopian idea. Um, more more um, down to earth, we're creating a documentary record for future historians, right? So 50 years from now, when historians want to know what Midwestern Americans lived like, they'll have this archive that we've been building up. Um, so I'm going to move on from that now and talk about our topic today, uh, which is the pandemic and everyday life locally. Um, when, when the pandemic started, it didn't take long for us to recognize we're actually sitting in a pretty good position here because we have these folks who have been paying attention to their everyday lives for a couple of years. And the pandemic is just the best example of the way in which historic events shape everyday life, right? I mean, it's, it is in everyday life where everything has been disrupted from where we work to how we work to, I mean, in the early days of the pandemic, how we get our food, all of these profound routine things that we all do just really um, dramatically disrupted. And so we started, um, you know, from pretty early in the pandemic thinking we need to do some work around the pandemic with our archive. And we also have to mobilize our archive to get more material the pandemic. So those are two things we've been working on for the last couple of years. Um, for this uh, project, which comes out of, uh, you know, a sort of a research project we've been working on for the last year or so, we wanted to ask how, how uh, time has been disrupted in the everyday. Time, of course, is really an, a central concern when you're thinking about the everyday. The idea of time is right in that word, everyday, right? It's about something that's repeated on a daily basis. But um, we, given that um, there's this widespread recognition that time has been disrupted by the pandemic and the fact that that showed up very consistently in our archive, in the diaries that our writers were writing, we wanted to look at them closely and see if we could make some uh, observations about the ways in which time has been disrupted. So here you see our research questions, right? How do our writers represent the disruptions of time in the pandemic? How does this play out in short, medium, and long-term timeframes, right? I said to you before, you know, you've probably had the sensation that the week has gone by too fast or that the day has gone by too slow. Um, but beyond that, there's also the ways in which the pandemic has disrupted our ability to plan um, and to look forward three months, six months, nine months. Um, and so we wanted to look at like sort of different timeframes and how time was disrupted differently, uh, depending on how you um, sort of set the time frame. Um, and then on to some other questions that really emerged out of the archive um, um, is this question of the, the relationship between time and belonging, right? Um, there is a sense in which um, your narrative about yourself, your, the story that you tell about yourself, 
is very much usually, if you're a Western individualist, um, future oriented, right? So when you think about yourself, you're thinking about where you're going, where you're going to be some months or years down the road. Um, and there is an idea among sociologists and people who study everyday life that that, that notion of a future self is connected to uh, your sense of belonging where you are in the present, right? And so we wanted to think about that nexus, like between belonging and the, and, and, the, and the sense of a future and the pandemic, how the pandemic had sort of disrupted that. Um, one of the reasons why this question interested us is because we're in Muncie, which is this town that has a kind of larger narrative hanging over it of decline. Right, that Muncie is a place that you know had a boom, a boom period decades ago, um, and that has been in a kind of cultural decline and a kind of economic decline. And so, oh, and, uh, one of the the um, sort of nuances of the way we started thinking about this is how does living in a place that has that kind of narrative interact with your narrative as an individual, uh, as an agent with the future, and how did the pandemic mess all this stuff up? So, in a sense, that's like really what we're looking at. Um, for the next couple of minutes, I'm going to I'm going to sort of just give an overview of a variety of different ways in which the disruption of time has shown up in our writers' work, um, and then I'm going to hand it off to Jim to dig into that last question about the local narrative decline and how that is um, informing the way people are thinking about the pandemic and thinking about their own narratives. Um, this is just a quick overview of what we've got in the archive. Um, this is actually, this slide is a is a, maybe six months old. And so we actually have more than this slide says. We've had two more diary collections uh, since we prepared that slide. Here are some examples of our diarists talking about, um, talking about disruptions of time. This is one of our writers. I don't remember this happening as much before COVID. Occasionally, time would drag on or long periods of time would go quickly, but mostly it just clicked along like normal. Now it's totally normal for me to look at the clock and be like, how the hell? Um, and then another writer here, and this quote is interesting because the person is talking about how she felt like, I'm not, I can't remember if it's a she or he, felt like um, public agencies are moving too slowly. Public policymakers are moving too slowly. Um, but uh, the pandemic is going really fast and the days are going really fast. So these are the kinds of things that we're interested in, sort of people's everyday consciousness, how they're feeling these sort of conflicts and, uh, co and contradictions with time. Um, uh, one thing we noticed is that, uh, uh, that time and space relationships are really connected to each other. Um, having your space messed up also messes up your time. Um, and so if you look at that first uh, quotation, here we have somebody talking about how working from home means that all of these things that are usually going on in different places are now happening in the same place. Um, and how that is sort of contributing to a sense of like time being like jumbled or disrupted. Um, uh, the second quote there is someone uh, describing how um, work from home eliminated the commute and how the commute actually shaped the day and a way that now the time seems to bleed over, right? Uh, that the stress of the day now uh, is not dammed up by the edges of the commute the way that it used to be. And so ways in which like where you are uh, influences how time seems to flow. Um, and this move, uh, this is we're moving toward uh, in a sort of I'm trying sort of transitioning here towards the material that Jim is going to talk about. Um, the way that the pandemic eliminated medium term medium term planning and made long term planning extremely difficult. Um, I, I can't tell you how many places in the archive you hear people saying, "I can't circle a date on the calendar right now." I feel funny. Um, I feel funny talking to my kids about next summer's vacation. Right, uh, because you know, of course, a lot of people have had things canceled, and and so long term planning is is maybe even more disrupted than daily sort of time, um, and that um, and I think this is sort of the underlying thesis of what we're presenting here: um, the inability to plan medium and long term 
uh, is what sort of gets into your autobiographical self, into the story that you're able to tell about yourself. Um, you know, we, um, we've done a lot of reading among other scholars about, um, you know, sort of how diaries work, right? Um, and, you know, people agree that diaries are forms of life writing, like they're, 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 they're a place where you tell the story of your life. The day diary is an interesting case of that, right? Because all we ask people to do is say what happens in the one day. But it's, it's, it's actually uncommon for people to not link that to longer time spans, right? It seems almost like the diary as a kind of a genre that people know invites looking forward and looking backwards. And so the diary is a place where people situate the present day relative to their past and their future. And so we felt like this was, a, you know, we, this is an opportunity to look at um, how, you know, I guess in a certain way, the simplified question here is when all time is messed up, how does your autobiographical sense also get messed up? Um, and then of course, the third factor in this is the local, you know, sort of setting. Um, um, and so, you know, again, these are some premises of our argument here that life narratives in Muncie take place in relation to a larger local narrative of industrial decline and tenuous renewal, influencing imagined futures and writers' sense of belonging or non-belonging. Um, and that, you know, this amounts to something that's kind of a localized structure of feeling. A structure of feeling is sort of like a set of parameters in which people in the same place and time feel. Not to suggest that everyone feels the same, but that there's kind of a horizon within which uh, people in the same time and place are going to feel about certain things. Um, and so with that, um, I'm going to hand it off to Jim and he's going to talk to you about um, uh, you know, the local, the local narrative, um, and then what two of our, um, two of our writers, uh, how this sort of comp complex dynamic showed up for them. All right, thanks, Pat. Um, Pat, you'll be the, uh, the slide jockey for sure. us. Sure, yeah, I can see that. So, um, thank you. Uh, back one. Thank you. Um, <laughs> So I want to begin by talking a little bit about uh, Muncie's narrative and why the, the locale matters. Of course, I don't need to explain to this audience too much about that narrative because uh, obviously we're all familiar with it. Uh, we live in this area. But uh, there's a couple things that really become salient when we begin to look at the ways in which uh, some of our diarists construct their future. Uh, and there's a uh, a relationship between their vision of the future and the place that they're in now. And that fits into their sort of life narrative that, that you can detect at least fragments of that narrative in the contributions they've made to our project. So as we know, uh, Muncie is a, is a Rust Belt city. It's formerly a center of industrial production in several industries. Uh, those industries have largely declined, at least in terms of the number of people employed in those areas. And in this, at the same time, the Eds and Meds, the university and the hospital complex have become the anchors of the local economy. Uh, and this transition is not unusual. This is a transition we see in lots of Midwestern communities in the last several decades, uh, and, and also in some other parts of the country as well. Uh, there's also in Muncie an enduring set of social divisions that are expressed geographically. These divisions are built around uh, class and, and around race. So the differences between the north side and the south side in Muncie are, are quite familiar. Uh, there are still neighborhoods that are specifically uh, African-American communities uh, within the city. So there's still a clear sense of segregation uh, in the city. And to a considerable extent, as the university has become a more prominent institution in Muncie over the last several decades, the town gown tensions that have been there for a while, they overlay these other enduring social divisions and uh, reinforce them, particularly in terms of the educational divide that we see, not just in Muncie, but uh, across the United States now. The other bit of the locale that, that really matters is that Muncie is Middletown. Uh, it's, it's through all of the research done by first the Lynns and then by their many successors uh, that it's gained a reputation as a kind of emblematic community. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's a complicated claim to suggest that Muncie's a typical American city, but uh, it certainly 
is seen as and is and represents what some people think of as the sort of quintessential American place. Um, one of the arguments as well that emerges from a lot of the Middletown literature is that there's a cultural lag locally, that the people who live here are a step behind in terms of trends, fashions, various aspects of, of American cultural life. Um, and so this contributes to its reputation as a classically provincial American community. Um, and so what we want to do today is talk a bit about how the locale figures in the life writing of some of our contributors. Um, they use it as a device for framing um, <clears throat> their, uh, their life story um, and particularly making sense of both the present and the future. So yeah, go ahead, Pat. Um, <clears throat> um, now, as we, before we start and before I introduce our two uh, diarists, I did wanna note that the two that we're presenting um, are uh, particularly illustrative of this, this pattern. We don't suggest that they're typical either of our diarists or of the community as a whole in any way. Uh, they're both men. Um, they're um, both um, in their uh, you know, middle to, to later middle ages. Uh, uh, and they both have pretty negative views of the city. That's not necessarily representative of our a full panel of, of diarists and contributors to the project. Uh, as I, there are others who uh, use the same uh, sort, of sort of sense of place to construct a different, much more positive narrative about the community and how it factors into their lives. Uh, uh, but these two, as I said, are really rich illustrations of how uh, a kind of place-based narrative can intersect with uh, life telling. Uh, and it gives us a pretty good background for, for getting a sense of how the pandemic interrupted the ways in which the locale shapes people's life stories. So, so let me introduce you to the first of two examples here. Uh, A23 is, is this diarist, someone in their early 40s, male, uh, trained uh, in graduate school, has a professional and public facing job. Um, he is re relocated to the city or, or located here from uh, the, the South uh, for professional reasons, as well as uh, to some extent for personal uh, reasons. He has local in-laws. Um, and as you read through his diaries, especially you know, the pre-pandemic diaries, what you see is lots of emphasis on the fact that his future lie elsewhere. Uh, and he uses Muncie as a kind of uh, counterexample of where he wants to live. Much of his diary writing talks about his pursuit of his forever town, as he calls it. Uh, and the one thing he knows for sure is that the, the forever town is not Muncie. Uh, it's someplace else. It's different uh, than Muncie. Um, he talks a lot about how his days in Muncie are, uh, are, are officially numbered. Uh, he talks about saving money to uh, be able to put the down payment on a house somewhere else. Uh, he talks about how he sees the community as uh, a place that is really in decline. So this narrative of decline really figures a lot in how he explains his own sort of personal trajectory uh, through all of this. At one point, he takes a, a job um, uh, driving um, Uber shifts as a way to save money for that down payment in another place. And he, like many other people, he believes, have escape strategies from Muncie. Uh, the city is, as he puts it, very fractured, bitter, exhausted. Uh, in another passage, he talks about how the community has been burning down and it's not quite all the way burned down, uh, but it's, that's not really his concern because his plan is to be elsewhere uh, and he won't take part in the reconstruction process after that, that burning down uh, and all of this. So all of this, uh, the, in all of this, the narrative of the city really allows A23 to distance them, themselves from the place um, and project themselves as living in some other community down the road. Um, uh, and so this is his, his personal trajectory, and it's, it's, uh, it, he uses the city's narrative to reinforce uh, how he sees his own future. Now the pandemic hits, and Pat can fast forward on this. Um, and the interesting thing that happens here is that his discussion of the future fades away. Uh, it, it no longer, uh, and excuse me, not just the future, but also the place starts to fade away. Uh, he doesn't talk nearly as much about his forever town, um, he's not commenting on the city as a way to reinforce this narrative about uh, his uh, uh, forever town. And instead, he starts to talk more about day-to-day -day engagements um, <clears throat> um, and how they um, um, diminish during the, the pandemic. So he really welcomes the break. He welcomes uh, the chance to have what he calls a sabbatical. Uh, 
Um, and the, the other interesting thing is that his focus on time starts to shift to the present. Uh, he talks about using time wisely, not wasting it, filling it with goodness. He talks about how grateful he is for the people he knows here in Muncie uh, and, and how much he loves them. So there's a real uh, remarkable shift in tone between his presentation of the community in the pre-pandemic period uh, and the, the, the way he presents the community in the, the pandemic period. Mostly the, the community disappears uh, in large part because he's also not as focused on the future. He's focused uh, much more on the presence. Uh, at, at the end of uh, the period where his work is, is locked down, he's working from home, um, he starts to, to sort of express his sense of being an outsider once again. He, he talks about his frustration with local residents who aren't using the mask mandates or aren't taking the mask mandate seriously. Uh, and he worries about engaging with people who are nasty around uh, some of these pandemic issues. So the interesting story here is that the town figures very prominently in his projections of the future for himself. Uh, but when the future gets erased, so do does his uh, uh, consideration or his discussion of the town in uh, the diary entries uh, that he writes during the pandemic period. So, so that's one example of uh, someone who's, uh, who uses the community as a way, as a foil for his uh, projection of his life story, uh, and then has that dynamic interrupted by uh, the onset of the pandemic. So we have a second example uh, of the ways in which the locale intersects with life telling and in which the pandemic uh, disrupts that a little bit. And that is uh, diarist D50. Uh, D50 is our, uh, uh, perhaps our wittiest diarist. He's one of our, our, our really uh, fun reads. Uh, he has a number of devices uh, that he uses. Um, he is a trailing spouse. Um, he is a, a trained, trained in color, culinary school, uh, but he's not working here in, in Muncie, partly for health reasons. He's had health troubles. Uh, and partly because he's a trailing spouse, he's followed uh, his wife who's taken a job here in the city. Um, and what's interesting about the way he writes his diaries is that they are projections into the future uh, in which he addresses a future socialist parad paradise. He does this quite often through these very clever footnotes uh, in his, uh, uh, his diary entries. Um, and in doing this, he kind of positions himself as kind of seeing what's going on in the way that most people in the community don't and he's able to explain it to people in the future, and he sort of allies himself uh, with these, these residents of a future socialist paradise. Uh, so when he begins to talk about the community, he talks about uh, the ways in which he's alienated from it. Uh, in his diary, he talks about, uh, or excuse me, in his um, response to a directive where we asked him about uh, Muncie and, and his impressions of it, he talks about arriving here and being repulsed by the place uh, and, and and emphasizing that he really didn't want to live here. Uh, the city repelled him. Now, um, <clears throat> part of what happens is in this case is that the city's repulsiveness, the fact that he's not um, uh, attracted by the city, he's very critical of the city, uh, allows him to distance himself from the place. He does this in part by pretending to be an, uh, an anthropologist or writing an anthropological language, kind of playing off the Middletown studies. And what he does is he, he compares local residents here in Muncie to uh, the denizens of North American coastal regions and talks about how different the place is. And all, all of these devices kind of position him outside of the community. Um, and so eventually what happens is that he settles in a little bit uh, living in the community, but he still finds himself to be a dual citizen who is observing as an outsider, but also getting a little bit involved uh, here and there in one thing uh, or another. Uh, now, as the pandemic hits, and Pat can move forward to the next slide here, uh, things change. Um, and, and a big part of what changes here uh, is that like A23, he loses touch uh, with uh, the community. Um, <clears throat> um, and the reason for this in part is because he's staying at home. As you see here, he talks about how difficult it is to say with much certainty what's going on around the city because they so seldom uh, go out. Um, but uh, he does spend a lot of time commenting on and, and considering uh, the impact of the pandemic, as well as the political, env political environment of the United States 
uh, in 2020 and into early 2021 uh, in his various various diary entries. The pandemic becomes uh, pretty significant in part because he gets sick. He's not officially diagnosed with COVID, uh, but it seems likely that he, he did uh, catch COVID. Uh, and it puts him in the hospital for eight days, including several days uh, in an ICU, uh, ICU unit. Um, and so this combination of health troubles uh, and, and political upset uh, really captures most of his attention, most of his emphasis in the diaries uh, that he's writing through 2020 uh, and 2021. Um, when he does write about what's going on, he's talking about the national scene. He talks about how the United States is collectively like a child who doesn't understand that the time of reckoning is here at hand, here and now. And one of the interesting things in, in this period of his diary writing uh, and his contributions to the to the project, there's a lot of emphasis on the moment, on the here and on the now. And so like A23, he's really now suddenly zeroed in on the present. Um, there aren't as many asides to uh, his future socialist readers as there were before the pandemic. Um, and he has some very interesting passages where he still positions himself outside of the community, but it's focused more on the present. Uh, in one uh, of these passages, uh, he writes about how it occurred to me that something about watching bad weather from above while simultaneously living in it is totally uncanny. Uh, he talks about, uh, he's, he's talking about in this passage, uh, an, an oncoming storm. And he compares the oncoming store, uh, storm and looking at the Doppler radar image uh, to see what's happening right now in American society. Um, and so the creeping Doppler image, he writes, is almost as frightening as experiencing something bad about to happen to me or to anyone. That's what now feels like. And he italicizes the word now uh, once again. Um, and so in all of the, in, in these and some other passages, his focus is so firmly on the present that he's, he's less concerned about uh, sort of communicating to this imaginary future uh, that's so central to his writing in the uh, the pre-pandemic contributions to, to, to the project. Um, and so there's really a loss of the sense of, of the locale. When he does describe the, the community, he talks about uh, the, the consequences of lockdown, panic buying that he sees, the empty streets, the mask shortages, and so forth. Um, but he offers these observations as an example of America, not of Muncie now. It's, it's now, uh, it's, what he sees locally is simply an example of what he sees nationally. And the sense of specific locality is kind of erased uh, in, in his writing through this period. So these are a couple of examples of, uh, of diarists that are using the locale to help explain the, the present and, and their personal futures. Uh, but also examples of how when the pandemic comes along, it disrupts this mode of explaining um, uh, personal futures. Uh, and we don't claim that either of these examples, as I said, are typical uh, at all. They're just really good illustrations of the intersection of place and pandemic uh, in the writing that we're collecting. Uh, so I'll leave it there. Um, and if there's, there's an opportunity for questions, we'd be happy to entertain them. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate that. Uh, Aaron and Jeff, if, if you guys want to interject with questions, do so at any time. Um, failing that, I'll just, I'll just begin. So first of all, what strikes me about the, the selection of diarists that you used here um, is that they seem to be people who moved to Muncie, moved to Muncie somewhat recently, and their sense of themselves and their temporal sense of selves in relation to the town is structured by that. They see this as a place that they're passing through. And uh, do you think, um, I don't know, do, do you find something that's maybe a little bit different than that with people who seem to be long-term residents? So you're not the first person to ask that question. It's a, it's a really good point. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not one that, um, that we've sorted through specifically. I think there is a difference and it, it's, it's actually on our to-do list is to explore exactly this question, right? Mm -hmm. Is the fact that these two examples are people who came from somewhere else and landed here, does that contribute to their sense of being outsiders and shape the way they use the town to project the future? Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it's a, it's a, it's a good, there's a good reason to think maybe that's the case, right? Yeah. Um, I can also think though of examples of contributors, contributors to our archive who are, um, are also from elsewhere who come to the community, mm -hmm. but they use the place to construct 
a, a, a positive sense of the future, that they're working to improve the place. Yes, um, right. You know, what's going to happen next is positive. So being an outsider doesn't equate to having a negative view of the place. It's just that these two particularly good examples uh, were both happened to be negative uh, in this instance. Now, um, the... Um, uh, the the other uh, possibility is that people who are local don't pay as much attention to it's not as remarkable to them perhaps because they they don't have that outsiderness right you know yeah. so. we do have I mean we do have some people who are long timers you do um, yeah and I, you know I would have I mean we we haven't sort of gone back and looked for that question you know the question about like um, belonging and time we haven't sort of applied that to them necessarily um but i think you know back to this idea of the structure of feeling right i mean right. the you know i think it's i think it's hard to live in muncie for any length of time to have it be your home whether you designated as such or not mm -hmm. and not to have a position relative to this kind of narrative of decline Right. Yes. Um, I mean, I, I think, you know, we do, I'm thinking of one particular writer who is a, you know, an elderly guy who um, has been here, you know, who actually came back to town maybe 10 years ago after being gone for a while, but had grown up here and stuff. Um, I don't know that you hear him talking, or I should say that you read him talking about narratives of decline. He might be like the, the, the one most sort of dramatic exception, but you do get, I mean, I think, you know, that, that's what, that's kind of what we mean by a structure of feeling, right? It's not to say that everybody has the same feeling, right. but that your feelings are going to take place within this, within this, uh, you know, horizon. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so really, when, I mean, we did do a directive uh, survey about Muncie it was the first one we did. Like, usually we just do these diaries. But once in a while, we do a survey where we ask specific questions. And the first one was about, like, how do you feel about Muncie? And it was really dramatic how, like, things lined up. Right. I mean, just about everybody is either Muncie's going to come back or, mm -hmm. you know, yes, I don't know what to right. do. I'm living in this dying town, <laughs> you know. Nobody said it's it's fine. Yeah, that that's just not <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what are the aspects of Muncie that you think most directly contribute to the sense of decline? I mean, and I'll, I'll admit, I, I agree with you completely. It's 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 difficult to walk around Muncie for me uh, without noticing the decline. I belong to the reformist category there, and I think I would have structured my. Mm -hmm. My narrative, had I written one uh, along those lines, like Muncie is, is a place that exists in the past, and I would like it again to exist in the future. But what, what, what about Muncie do you think makes that palpable? You know, the everyday nature of the project um, shapes how that comes out. Um, I mean, if you're looking at diaries rather than like asking somebody, what do you think of Muncie? Yeah, you're right. looking at diaries, right? People talk about, you know, um, running into in the intoxicated people on the street, you know, um, that's a place where where stuff where where the stuff where attitudes about Muncie come up spontaneously, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, alternatively, people talk about the cultural um, the cultural resources that the that the, that the that the city has because of the university, that's right? right? Mm -hmm. um, there was one interesting day where uh, you know, like a third of our um, a third of our writers on one day either were at an event at Emmons or were like in the traffic that it created, you know? Right. And so there are ways in which like the, you know, the, the basically just the visual uh, atmosphere prompts people to talk about. And, you know, I think when, when D50 talks about Muncie, especially in the directive, but also earlier, like pre-pandemic, um, you know, as Jim pointed out, he's a really sharp writer, right? And so he has this almost literary way of like concretizing Muncie's, um, Muncie's condition via, you know, visual images. Yeah. Dr. Jeff Fry? Yeah, thank you for that. So as someone who uh, uh, has been aware of how my sense of time changes drastically when I travel, as opposed to when I've uh, started like the third week of the semester at Ball State, it's, it's, it's really different. So I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated about this uh, experience of time during the uh, pandemic. Uh, when I travel, it's like time gets extended. And when, uh, when we enter about the third week of the semester at Ball State, it's like, I don't count days anymore. It's like weeks go by. It's yeah, quite a yeah, different yeah. experience of time. 
But I wanted to actually uh, point out something else. And uh, there's a really uh, f fascinating and humorous lecture by Kurt Vonnegut. You can see this online about uh, narrative arcs of stories. Mm -hmm. And on the X uh, axis, there's the uh, there's time, and then on the Y axis, there's whether good things or bad things happen in the in the story. And so I'm curious about if people were to chart the narrative arc of their lives during the pandemic, mm -hmm. and you would overlay these on one another, what you would see? Would, would you see that most of them had flatlined, or or that some had taken significant dips into a trough from stage, or would you find some people who actually had found a way to make, you know, their lives were going better in some way. And, and it was maybe even a continual upward line. I just think this idea of a narr narrative arc of your life in the pandemic is interesting. Mm -hmm. That's it, yeah. You, you, again, there's just no one pattern. I mean, there were people who loved, you know, people, you know, on the professional side mainly who loved the working at home thing, especially if they were professional and, and single or without children. <laughs> um, but then there are also people who were, uh, you know, stressed by having to homeschool, work at home, mm -hmm. and, and all of that. Um, and then there were people who there wasn't an arc because the, there wasn't movement, right? Either physical movement or chronological movement. You know, it's just sort of like day after day, same. You know, that's that's what it seems to have felt like for a lot of people. So on Vonnegut's graph, they'd just be a dot; they wouldn't be a line. So. Yeah, no, I think that's really interesting. I mean, what you were saying at the beginning there, Jeff, you know, I mean, this is people who write about everyday life have been have noted this for a long time that like, you know, there's, uh, there's definitely a disjunction between clock time and and experiential time or like subjective time, right, that we don't, you know, clock time is routine is, is regularized, right, but we don't actually experience the passage of time that way. And so in a way, that's like what prompted this question for us about, you know, with everybody saying like, what happened to time? Why is time broken? Like, it seemed like, a, you know, that's a sort of connection back to that, um, that sort of critical concept from the study of everyday life. Um, but on your question about development, I mean, I would go along with what Jim said, you know, one, another, of course, and this won't be a surprise to anybody, right? But um, one of the tropes in the pandemic diaries is people uh, saying, people feeling bad that they're not suffering as much as other people. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, people, um, right. people, uh, you know, like I'm thinking of one particular writer who says, like, I needed this slowdown so much. I mean, we saw that the example Jim gave was one, but another writer said, you know, very much the same thing. I needed this slowdown so much. Um, I'm discovering that I'm an introvert, you know, um, and so that's, an, you know, I mean, there certainly were people whose arc, whose arc in the everyday scale is different from what you might expect. Um, how that relates to the sort of longer scale is, you know, is kind of another question. But. Yeah, well, I think the person that Jim was describing a while ago, it wouldn't be a dot, it would be just a flat line. Yeah across, yeah, across the graph. I suppose, yeah, because time does continue in at least outside of them. But their perception is that time's not moving and nothing's changing, right? So that's the yeah. same day in your pajamas, you know, spending more time in your all those kinds of comments, sort of point to you know nothing's really changing, and it's it's the same day. It's Groundhog Day ish, yeah, kind yeah. of feeling. Yeah, Joe Nelson. Yes. Uh, I have a question that kind of like would piggyback a little bit off of Jess, like trying to go into the aspect of like the narrative arc. Now, like one of the things I understand is that she started collecting these entries from like 2016 and going all the way into 2022, essentially allocating for six years worth of collection. Like my one question that I have is that like from what you've noticed, maybe from say like initial individuals, I just was one always wondering Considering the themes of these journals, I find it interesting considering that even though I'm living in Muncie currently and working in Muncie, I'm a transplant here where I wasn't born here. I came here as an undergrad to Ball State, then I left for a couple of years, came back for grad school, and then I decided to settle in and to work here to sort of like give back more to the town that's given me so much and helped me develop and everything. So my question is, and among like the narrative arcs that you have seen, like have you seen like some individuals that, especially maybe if they're younger individuals where they have those starry eyes that you see, like not just an evolution of their view of Muncie, like similar to what we've seen in the two examples, but just as they grow older from like younger to older, like does their mindset change? Like do their aspects of 
Mm. That's kind of like what they're looking for, kind of shifts focus as they like realize that what they valued as like a younger individual now no longer coincides with what they value now that they're older with like more years of experience. You know, it's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I do think that, you know, what, what, you know, in the diaries that Jim was talking about, you know, what you're seeing is the way that the pandemic um, halted people's way of thinking about Muncie um, and, and, and in a sense sort of stopped them from thinking about Muncie. I mean, one thing that's, uh, you know, I mean, maybe this, this is like sort of obvious, but like in the early pandemic diaries, people weren't going out. So back to Kevin's, you know, Kevin's point before about how, um, uh, you know, Kevin asked like, you know, how does Muncie's condition show up, right? Um, one of the reasons why it doesn't show up a lot is people aren't out there seeing it, right? You know, they're, right. they're in their house. But I mean, the, the question you're asking about like people's attitudes changing as they age, I think, the, I, don't, I don't think we can track that by reading a diarist's um, entries from start to finish because we've only, I mean, we still have only had six years, right? And some of our contributors are in early and out later and vice versa. So they yeah, have, right, that's, that's a ton thing. of people who've been writing for six years. We do have a few, but the panel has evolved over time. Yeah, but I think, I think what you see more often is in the, in the context of an individual diary, somebody will tell the story about how their attitudes have changed. Right, um, and we do we do see that a good deal. I was talking before about um, about the older guy who moved back to Muncie, you know, maybe ten years ago. He talks about Muncie a lot. He he describes Muncie from the past. He um, he talks a, he talks about his memories. Like the whole place is charged with all these memories of his life, you know, mm -hmm. um, and so. And this is somebody who doesn't say anything, never sort of mentions anything about Muncie's decline, right? But has a lot to say about what he feels about the town. And so I think the this goes to that thing I was saying before about the way diaries work, right? I mean, I think even if you've never kept a diary, you know what the genre of a diary is and you know the kinds of thing it does. And one of the things it does is it says, this is what I did today. And this is what it means, right? And what it means has to do with the future and the past. Exactly. Right? And so you do get, we do, and I think, you know, you're asking a good research question, actually, right, which is to say, like, let's look for these moments where people are talking about their belonging um, uh, to the place, and when they're talking about how it's changed, because they do, you know, they do, um, they do look back frequently, and they, and they look forward frequently. Right. It's like it's almost like a trope of the diary. There's a moment where it happens. Right. Where you link what's happening today with with the past and the future. So the thing that strikes me most right now about time and pandemics is the something about the duration of the pandemic and how my sense of time has changed from those early pandemic days until now. Um, Part of that might just be a product of the fact that the pandemic has gone on longer um, than I at least imagined it would two years ago. So I thought of the pandemic as a break, like one of your diarists did. I mean, I think this is actually common in, in the public literature about the pandemic. Um, you know, it, it was referred to in, in one piece as the Great Reset, as if yeah. we suddenly had two months to ourselves in our house with our loved ones, uh, you know, with our entertainment and our books or whatever. Uh, and I think your one diarist captured very much the mood of that, even though there was this looming public health crisis. Now, this is, I mean, this has been 24 months. So I'm done with that. I'm incapable of experiencing that moment of reset, right? I'm experiencing something different, something, you know, like it's, it's, it's this long drag. So I think how I would express this in relationship to my life and to the place, Muncie or, or, or Ball State or Indiana or whatever, um, would differ very much from April of 2020 to yeah. April of 2022, um, do you see much evidence of, of that kind of thing, other than the one diarist that I that I'm no kind of we because we about. asked about the pandemic, uh, another one of our surveys as opposed to diary things, and that's a common thought, right? Is this is going to be this sharp brief moment where things are shut down and disrupted, and then it's going to resume, 
And then it goes on and it's on and, and you start to talk about, people start to talk about exactly that phenomenon and that becomes a, a prominent point of discussion, not just in our diaries, right? It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think too, one interesting thing that happened is we had a diary, a diary day that was during a lull in the pandemic, yeah. during a down period. Um, and it, there was not as much about the pandemic in it. Um, I mean, we were ready to end it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the not, not, the, not Mondays, but the, the, the one just before that, like one of the big takeaways was the pandemic is back. You know, the pandemic is back and we've got, it. um, and so, I mean, I think that's something that we're going to keep tracking, right? You know, is like how people are thinking about, I mean, this goes to the question of time though, right? You know, not knowing when it's going to end is the, is in a, in a sense, the big, the big eraser of the future, you know? Yes, exactly. Uh, um, and so, I mean, I think, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think we're all, I, I shouldn't speak for everybody. I think I am, you know, sort of, silently thinking that it's kind of over with this undercurrent of dread that maybe it's not, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and we'll see, we haven't looked at the diaries from Monday yet. Um, yeah, um, we should, we should emphasize that, you know, we're not taking a survey here, right? This is not a of course. scientific sample uh, that we can project from or generalize from. Uh, we're trying to get a sense of how people are expressing their experiences of this, you know, and what the range of expression is. Mm -hmm. uh, at least in our group. Yeah. You know, from my own experience of time, uh, it seems like um, it's affected a lot by sort of rites of passage or events that I associate doing in certain seasons of the year. And the pandemic has really curtailed that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that's been reported in any of the diary entries. That... Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Around, around the holidays um, of 2020, of 2020. Um, people talking about that, um, talking about like the, the, you know, the rituals that have been diminished or disrupted. Um, uh, people do people giving lists of stuff that their kids missed out on. Um, so yeah, definitely. Um, and that, you know, that's actually a good thing to bring up, Jeff. I think that's something that we might want to talk about as we're revising this material, right? Because those markers, you know, seasonal markers, ritual markers, are also a big part of the experience of time for people. So um, this, this is to get back to an earlier theme uh, about the appearance of decline in Muncie. Um, do you find that the, the relationship between the university or possibly also the hospital and the town plays a big role in this, in how people express this? Uh, especially given that a lot of your diarists seem to be, or at least the diarists that you've cited tonight seem to be newcomers to the town, um, possibly with some relationship to the hospital and the university such that they look at the town differently than people who identify with the town before that they do the university might? Uh, that's a good question. The, um, I mean, one of the, we talked a bit earlier about the structure of feeling in that, um, you know, some people look at the community and see it as an opportunity for uh, contributing in a personal way to its revival. Mm -hmm. and, and the people who frame it that way, the university is referenced as a, an asset, a strong point, yes, or, right, you know, yeah. a, a positive part of their experiences. Um, the second of the two diarists that I talked about, D50, uh, is one of the few who sort of cites the university in a way that, you know, is connected to more negative depictions of the community, at least in part, um, you know, suggests the university isn't that kind of an asset uh, in, in the same way. Um, it's also true that, as you, your question implied, right, the, a lot of our contributors, not all, but have either a connection to the university or have uh, they're they're educated and you know members of the middle class and so they view the university from that perspective yeah. uh, and we do have some people who are um, you know from a more working class background from other parts of town and so forth um, mm -hmm. but if there's a skew it's it's a skewed toward the educated side uh, in all this and so that probably shapes a little bit about how they imagine the university fitting in I, I Pat I can't remember a ton about the hospital one way or the other can you no, we did have a we did have a guy who worked at the hospital in the very early years, like the BBC version, um, and I think he's 
he, I don't think he made the jump after the VBC was over. Okay. Um, um, and he, I mean, he, he loves Ball State and loved, uh, you know, loved working at the hospital. I did, I mean, I did want to add one thing, both A23 and D50, the ones that Jim talked about today, both of them are critical of both the town and the university. That's a good point. Uh, good point for you too. Yes. Um, you know, A23 as, you know, the outsider who wants to get out, um, you know, um, you know, sort of sees, you know, sees the, sees univer the university and, you know, pr professors as kind of looking down on the town, sees townies looking down on the university, mm -hmm. right? Um, and being resentful of the university and, and, and really sees that disconnect as part of the problem. So it's interesting. I mean, there is this way in which I think both of them have an outsider's view that like makes some things visible, you know, that, um, that are kind of useful. Um, yeah. So I, I just want to clarify before we go to, to Dr. Fry, I wasn't thinking necessarily uh, of whether the university is an asset to the town. I mean, that's, that, that's a different kind of question, an interesting one. But I was thinking of this in terms of my own experience uh, as somebody who uh, is reasonably uh, entrenched in Muncie uh, and positively disposed towards it. I sometimes feel as if I, I look at the town uh, from the perspective of the university uh, and even how I orient myself spatially. I live halfway down, I live halfway between the downtown and the university. I walk to the university and the university appears new, especially since I walk through a lot of new architecture on my way to my office. Uh, so I'm, I pass everything new before I, I enter the historic part of the university. Whereas when I walk downtown, I mean, I really see decline, and I don't mean that in a, in a negative sense, so I would be more inclined mm -hmm. to say I see the past, and part of this is architectural. Uh, I cross the river, and I see this stationary store there that looks like uh, its exterior was last painted in about 1957, so in approaching the river and looking over at City Hall, and the Muncie uh, Central Field House, I feel like I'm looking at the 1950s. And, and, and that part of that might be what inspired me uh, a long time ago to try to renovate that part, right? Because as I, I, like I said, I was a reformist in my relationship to Muncie. It's as, as if I saw the past and decided I wanted to make it the future, but that's partly because uh, I'm an outsider, but also partly because I'm looking at Muncie from the standpoint of the university. I think not condescending it, but I'm thinking about time differently mm -hmm. when I'm looking mm -hmm. looking towards the university uh, westward rather than eastward uh, or southeastward uh, towards the town. So that that's that's kind of how I was thinking about it. Like yeah, it's, it's really the newness, yeah. the newness of the university, uh, because Ball State is is not a university that's in decline. Some some people might differ <laughs> from me, and we can debate <laughs> that at work, uh, but at least physically. It's it's a place that's in development. Yeah. So you don't yeah. see the past when you look at it, even though it has historic architecture uh, and a deep history, and it does celebrate its relationship to the Ball families and things like that. The Ball, the visually to me, it, it it looks and 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 it also feels like something that's not yet. Whereas yeah. Yeah. when I look in the other direction to the city, I see something that was and is no longer, mm -hmm. um, and you know that's I. I I, I feel that sometimes we university people and, and I presume hospital people are somewhat like us in these regards. We, we exist in this kind of space between the university uh, and, and, and the town, which do have different kinds of temporalities. Yeah, that um, so that's the, sense, yeah. yeah that, I mean, that's the set of ideas I was thinking about, but I don't wanna ramble too long because Dr. Fry has another question. Yeah, well, I, wanted, I just want to make an observation that particularly at the beginning of the pandemic, I was uh, aware of just how long everything seemed to take. Going to the grocery store was like mm -hmm. almost like, you know, an hours long event by the time I got prepared to go and came back and wiped down my packages and wiped off the door handles and everything. Yeah. It just everything took forever uh, because we didn't know. <laughs> you know. But, but the, other, the other thing is, I'm wondering if the diarists have, have recorded any reflections about uh, how the pandemic has affected their experience of aging. Mm. How, it's, how it's affected aging. Yeah, uh, I mean, th th for example, a person might feel like, man, I've aged 10 years in the last two months. 
I don't know that I've seen that, Jim. Yeah. Do you... No, I, I can't think of anything, at least off the top of my head, where they, they speak about it in those terms. Um, we, you know, we have a few people who are retirees and, and, you know, so there's some discussion of, you know, medical challenges, things like that. Um, but not in a way that, you know, suggests the pandemic is a cause or an exacerbator of that problem. So I haven't seen that. Yeah. And I was also wondering about the, uh, I thought this is fascinating, this is the kind of experience of, uh, Groundhog Day, eternal return. Yeah, the same uh, thing yeah. over and over again. I mean, I think there's some possibly some sobering implications of that, given our need for for our psychological health, our brain health, our plasticity, and so forth. So uh, I don't know, just something that occurred to me. You definitely, definitely see that. You mm -hmm. definitely see that. In fact, there's somebody. I, I think they may be quoted in the written version of this paper. Um, Who's, who 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 um, attributes the confusion about time to the fact that nothing's changing, hmm. you know, to the sort of Groundhog Day edness <laughs> of yeah. of existence right now. Um, you know, not not really right now. Really, more in the you know in the in the height of the lockdown period. Um, but you know, I mean, when you say there's like a disquieting sort of implication there, I mean, if you want to go existential on this, right? I mean, potentially what the pandemic is doing is telling us what's always already been there. You know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah. um, that's another way of sort of reading it. Um, um, which you know, of course, is utterly you know tied up in the sort of question of everyday life. You know, um, the the main temporality of everyday life, arguably, is repetition. Yes. Right. Everyday life yeah. is where you brush your teeth and make your lunch and, you know, et cetera. Um, and, you know, uh, one test of mental health is how you feel about those things. Right. You know, is routine comforting or is it deadening? Yeah, but the, neur the neuroscientists would say maybe sometimes it's, you should try to brush your teeth with your other hand. I think really was it, I think it was a Dewey or William James actually said that. I can't remember which one. I think it was Most Dewey people. actually suggested that people should brush with their, their left hand. Yeah, and, and the neuroscientists <laughs> interested in neuroplasticity emphasize do things differently. Yeah. So did you see an uptick in uh, in the amount that people were writing or the frequency with which they were writing during the pandemic for this very reason, the fact that the everyday is highlighted? We uh, had a problem, which is that we couldn't recruit during the pandemic. <laughs> and so, you know, I mean, the first first year of the pandemic, I mean, we've been getting a lot of our new recruits from um, public events. Um, and so we lost people during the pandemic. And, you know, the, the I mean, we're, we picked back up um, and we're back, you know, sort of at our, you know, kind of like what we would like to have more, but we're kind of at our at our average now. Um, but I would say no to that. I mean, we got some really great detailed diaries, but from the people that usually do that, I would say, Jim, do you think that's right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of which, if anyone wants to sign up, uh, you can find us online at Everyday Life in Middletown and there's contact information. So uh, just get in touch with us that way and you can, uh, you can join up for the next round of diaries. Okay. So we're at time now. So I just want to, uh, Thank Pat and Jim and, and, and the rest of you for attending. Joe, do you want to close us off? Yes, I can go ahead and close us off. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, thank you, everybody who's joined us in both the Zoom call and those of us who are going to be watching this video either right now as it's gone live or later on once we get it archived. We thank you for paying attention to our Muncie Public Library's Facebook page as well as all of our different websites to keep addressed of all of the different events and goings on that we have. We'll be signing off for this session and please pay attention to our websites for the next time that we offer big questions, big ideas. And we thank everybody else and have a good night.